won medals. For these women, life after the Olympics will present some really serious decisions. Some will continue to compete, but many will retire and seek careers. Economic opportunities will become a primary concern. What kind of financial future will they face? And how will their athletic achievements help them make the choices that lie ahead? And who better to address these questions than the founder and president of the Women's Sports Foundation, Olympic athlete and ABC sports commentator Donna De Verona, and with her, Dr. Judith Steam, vice provost for the University of Southern California and former chairperson of women's studies at USC. And Donna... Let's start with you. You've been through all of this. 1964, a couple of goals in swimming in Tokyo. Uh, when you came back, what were the opportunities afforded you, both, well, professionally, you were very young, but mm -hmm. also academically, as opposed to what a young swimmer with two gold medals would face today? Well, Frank, I think that you and I talked about this and agreed that the sport experience equips you with a lot of abilities. That is, the ability to be a team player, the ability to know how to lose, the ability to know how to set goals. That's how I think I've been able to get through those years when those opportunities weren't available. When I quit, there weren't scholarships for women. Since that time, because you weren't we offered a single scholarship and you came back, Donna? No. Uh, Don Schill and my teammate went off to Yale University yes. that did not, and I couldn't enter Yale because I was a woman. They didn't accept women in the college. And he had a college scholarship. And that's why the Women's Sports Foundation was founded to foster these things. My concern is that after these Olympians go back to school, that law that opened the door, and we've seen more women participate than ever before, has now been basically diluted because of a Grove City decision. Well, let's be more specific. Yeah. You're talking about Title IX, uh, which was voted in in 1972, right. and you're talking about the Supreme Court decision of uh, last City. spring, which uh, really kind of alters that. Basically, uh, the Supreme Court decision says uh, you have to be specific about the federal funding. Right. In other words, if you fund mathematics at a college, well, you have to have no discriminatory action there, but they can do what they want in the athletic department. That's right, and previously the interpretation by Congress w was different. If a school received one dollar for any program, every program had to come under the guidelines of non-discrimination under Title IX. Now, when our athletes go back to their college and universities, there's no language to protect them. That doesn't mean like a school like USC won't continue to support women's basketball, but it does mean in other schools, uh, smaller schools with lesser budgets, that they don't have to answer to not providing sport opportunities for women. And that was really the law that opened the door. So they may be faced with, in some instances, the case that I was faced with, no scholarships, uh, yet they will be faced with a better um, acceptance of women's sports. There are more women involved in coaching in the health fields, health-related fields, in the corporate world in support of sports. So there are those doors open, but I think we all ought to be concerned about that law that, uh, that well, helps I know, so much. Uh, Judith, I'm sure you are concerned. Uh, we were talking just a few moments ago. Where are things right now? Right now, some remedial legislation has been proposed, and it is in fact passed the House of Representatives. The big question is whether it's going to pass the Senate, and if it does pass the Senate, and the two versions are identical enough that it can get to the President, whether or not the President will take action on it. Frankly, if I were a candidate for President, or if I were an incumbent President, I would see this as a wonderful vehicle to demonstrate my commitment to women's full participation. I think I'd also like to point out that Title IX wasn't just affecting universities and colleges. It also affected junior high school, senior high school. My daughters all played high school athletics, and it's very likely they might not have had that chance if that particular Title IX had not come into existence. Um, high school athletes in 1972 were 7% women. Now they're about one-third women. It's by no means parity. It's about 35% now, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's a matter of participation. You still don't have the same kind of investment in women's athletics. You still don't have schools feeling responsible to hire the same kind of coaching. Very often they'll pick a nice woman for the community to come be a woman's varsity high school coach, whereas for a man's team they will look for an expert. And so it's not just at the college level. It's that building that earlier level, that shared experience that all Americans have of going through junior and senior high school. That's very important and that 10 years later, 15 years later, reaps a dividend. Well, just quickly, let's be specific. Donna, you, you can hark back to 1964. Uh, how are things changed now for women in these games? We know that Carl Lewis, uh, we know what's going to happen to him. They, they're going to just bury him with Madison Avenue. Mm -hmm. But say uh, Mary Decker, uh, the other women in the well, competition. Well, uh, uh, Mary Decker, track and field, I think, because of the trust fund and because they command big audiences, are able to get 
paid for appearances. So if they stay in track and field and, and be visible, then there'll be a, uh, related commercial opportunities for them. But however, you've got a basketball team that won the first gold ever. All 12 of those athletes and were on scholarship. Team, Flo Hyman. That's right, the first time in team sports that we've really been able to, to get win a gold medal. Pam and Janice, Lo Pam McGee and Janice Lawrence are going to leave this country and go to Italy to play in a professional mm -hmm. league because there isn't a professional league here mm -hmm. in this country yet. Well, I know. A few years ago. That's Donna, right. what advice would you offer a woman, Olympic athlete, going out into the real world? So to speak. I would say take your tools with you I, and, and uh, don't expect it to be there. Expect that you've got to start all over again. Look for a sports-related field. They're not closed to women anymore. There are a lot of people out there that are very open, but uh, get involved in organizations like the Women's Sports Foundation or in your community. Get to know who your congressman and senator is. If you're interested in Title IX and the rewriting of the, the law to protect those opportunities that have already been there. Men are great. They have the all-boys club. And we've basically had to recognize that we have to do things for ourselves. And that's the most important point I could make. And you've done it well. Thank, Thank you. you both for being with us. And Donna, we'll see you in a little while with synchronized swimming. Thanks again.